so amazing to be here. Thank you so much, Net Profit, and for all of you for taking your time to, to listen to me. Um, I'm going to start off by, by saying um, it's kind of it's my story. It's a story of an entrepreneur. And I remember when someone first told me about the word, I thought, oh, that's a bit of a, well, I thought wanky word. But, um, and, um, but if you look it up on Wikipedia, it really does say exactly what it is that I do. So I would suggest you have a look at that, and then you'll see the kind of stuff that I do. Because um, it hasn't been an easy ride bringing Ogilvy into the 21st century. It's taken 14 years, in fact, to do that. And um, so, and the brief was so open. It, it wasn't that I was employed as a, a creative or a planner. It, it was pretty much, um, I guess, a problem solver. So at the, in the early days, it was very much um, working out, uh, getting rid of, uh, moving them from analog to digital. And this is something that I have on my wall in my office. I don't know whether, I can hope you can read it. It must be considered that there's nothing more difficult to carry out, nor more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to handle than to initiate a new order of things. And that pretty much kind of um, sums it up for me on a daily basis, probably actually an hourly basis. Um, so when I was first there, uh, the main brief really was to look at analog um, and moving them from analog to digital. It was very much paper. Uh, driven, um, there, it was, um, there were tapes, there were couriers, and it was around the time that I started to notice technology really, really changing. So uh, copper bandwidth and pipes had been put in, although not in South Africa at the time, because I was trying to do digital delivery of TV commercials, and that was the only market that I couldn't do it with. And then I started to notice that you bypassed that, and you went straight to mobile, which is why I've always kept quite a, a close eye on South Africa, because I just thought there was a kind of a find a way and make a way attitude in, in, in being able to do that. But I was noticing, obviously, TiVo and, and 3D and mobile and gaming and social. And I was wondering how that then was impacting on, on TV advertising, um, especially because I wasn't watching ads. And yet, I've been in advertising for 25 years. So I was wondering, well, how are we going to um, be communicating with people in the future um, and not just broadcasting at people and, and trying to sell a bottle of, of Dove and, and how we would actually engage and interact? So that was kind of the beginning of my journey and in, in looking at technology. And I thought that people would be as excited as I was. That actually wasn't the case. So um, when I first started seeing all these lovely things that were happening, and I sent a note round to all of the staff, um, 1,600 people in the Ogilvy office in London, I got emails back saying, stop spamming me. Um, and a few people, I think, went to management and said, this girl has too much time on her hands. But that was then. Obviously, things have changed a lot since. But, so that it was understanding that technology was changing. And um, there are a few really important insights that I had over the course of, of that time. And I'm going to show you, the, uh, tell you about the insights and then show you what I did to kind of um, counteract them. So my first insight was that if I had some budget and, um, and autonomy, then I pretty much could do what the hell I wanted without anyone telling me what to do, because there was a lot of no's all the time. So freedom to test and learn. Um, but the problem was that no one was going to give me any budget. So that's why I started to look at different ways in which I could um, earn money, uh, outside of uh, Ogilvy. So Rory Sutherland, for instance, is our vice chairman, when, and he's such a brilliant speaker. So when he speaks at events, I act as his agent, and the money that I get in for him to speak comes into my lab R&D pot. So I have this small little pot of money that no one quite knows how much I've got in there or why, and no one tells me how to spend it. Um, and that is how I, I'm able to kind of um, be a bit more freer with, with all the different examples that you'll see coming up. So um, what I started to do with that money was all the different case studies that I was starting to do, because there's a, a big um, way in that I proved by doing. I put together the Ogilvy Labs website, a physical space as well, because I found that really important, because in the early days, when I'd seen things like interactive floor projections, and you could play a game of football on the, on the floor with these kind of virtual um, balls, and... Um, what I started to notice was that when you were saying that to people, they didn't understand what you were talking about, but if you showed them, then they would. So in our lab in, in London, the physical space is really important because it seeds ideas, and then you can um, show clients around um, and uh, staff around, lots of people around, all of the lab partners that um, have their kit in there, because the main aim for the labs is to educate, inspire, and innovate. I mean, that's pretty, it, pretty much it, um, simply. 
Um, so there are the different things we have in the physical space, anything from 3D printers to 3D TV screens, um, eye tracking, mobile gaming, touch screens, all of those kind of things. And, and we, we always make sure that it is, is updated and, and constantly um, putting new kit in there and trialing it and testing it. Um, and it's really important for us, that physical space, to just see those ideas with um, clients coming in and with staff. And there's only four of us in the lab. So, and there's, uh, what, there's 1,800 people if you include geometry, so 1,600 people in London. And it was very important for me at the very beginning that we would not be um, working to a job number or to clients. We had to remain back office. So therefore, it was a cost to Ogilvy to employ me in the beginning. And it's a very difficult place to be when a finance director is looking down his list of, well, who's paying for you? Uh, and it wasn't Dove, and it wasn't Ford, it, it was actually Ogilvy. Um, I was coming out of their pocket, so therefore we needed to make sure that we, we showed them um, a very clear value of success, so kind of set KPIs. So we all have different job functions within the labs, um, but there are only four of us, and we are allowed to experiment and, and do all of these other things, which I guess is a luxury, but it's a big company, Ogilvy, and it, it, if everyone is so busy with their day jobs and attached to job numbers and processes, it becomes difficult for them to offer value uh, to look at the things that we look at. So I started to develop something that was kind of quite process driven and I'll talk about that after you see a few of the examples of the lab's work that we've done in the last year. We do a semester of learning where we pick a specific topic and it's total immersive learning within that topic. Most of our clients who are bothered to come along to an event like this are kind of in the conversation with us. Ogilvy is culturally and traditionally quite good at working with people outside its sphere. And if we're better at doing that than other agencies are, we should take advantage of it. One of those case studies, for instance, came from a semester of learning. Oops. Slide come up. Oh. Um, and uh, for firstly, when um, before I set up the semesters of learning, I needed to put those KPIs in. So that was my second insight. So KPI is kind of um, a measurement of success. And so I call them my six R's. Um, and there, as long as everything that the lab does shows an increase in revenue, an increase in reputation, whether that be um, for PR or awards, 
an increase in recruitment of um, new diverse talent, which is through our Rough Diamond program, which I'll explain in a minute. Retention of existing staff, because we're doing new and exciting things for the, the kind of the hunters within the organization to um, get their teeth into and not stay doing just the day job. Relationships are all of the, the relationships we have with all the partners and suppliers and SMEs and startups, which we, I mean, pretty much all of those case studies you saw are all with startups and SMEs, not with huge, you know, Googles of this world, or they're with all the startups. And responsibility, which is where we kind of put, um, labs puts a lot of stuff back into mentoring programs. So the semesters of learning was, was started because I really needed to have a, a, a good understanding. I was spamming people, apparently, with all these emails of exciting things. And it actually made me realize maybe I should focus just on one thing at a time. So it's 24 weeks of um, intense learning on one subject, and it, it goes across all of the group. So anyone that is interested in wanting to find out about this, then they get involved. They're on our LunLab email group. But it's only for the people that give a shit. It's not for anybody else. It's only for those um, that are wired in a similar kind of way who don't mind change. So it's 24 weeks. So the, throughout the whole um, semester, we see 10 to 15 different companies every other week on that one topic. So my first ever one nine, 10 years ago was streaming. So we see 10 to 15 different streaming companies every other week. We then attach streaming to a brand, to a problem. So um, I'd seen the Ford chairman speaking, and um, it was like that big. It was buffering and pixelated, and I'd seen a company who could deliver full HD quality stream to your desktop, literally like that, and thought, well, why are they not communicating in that way? So I asked that question, and then we managed to sell it into Ford, which gave us two extra revenue streams, one, because we hadn't done internal comms for Ford before, and two, because we produced the content. So it wasn't a TV commercial, but it was a two-minute piece of content that went to 22,000 desktops in 19 countries in five languages. Um, and then we make the Ogilvy people make it. So there's only four of us in the labs, and I wasn't going to make a department of back office staff. So we make the Ogilvy staff within the TV department, even though they've never done a stream before. Um, we make all of them do um, all of the heavy lifting with all of these examples, which means it's a change agent. So therefore, it allows for all of the staff to learn all of these new skills. Um, and some of them find it really, really painful because it's not been done before. But once they've done it once, they then can offer it to the clients again and again. So therefore, Ogilvy can do TV and print, but they can also now do streaming and mobile and gaming and social and, and all the other things that we've done within the semesters. Um, so I'm on my 14th lab day. Um, so I've probably done at least two or three semesters a year for the last nine, 10 years. So as I kind of say I have enough knowledge to be dangerous about everything, but I know the right people to drill down to to get stuff done which is kind of the main thing. It doesn't just end up as an idea in someone's bottom drawer. So we attach it to business and then get it implemented. And then throughout the whole semester, we have lab lunches. And at the end of the semester, we have a lab day. And all of the great um, partners that we've seen exhibit for the day or speak for the day. And it's all live streamed, free of charge. And, um, and it, it's kind of, it's in most people's calendars now. It's just kind of, it, it just happens twice a year. And, and, and that's how the semesters learn, are learned. The other insight was the collaboration and relationships, and I've got a few examples of how um, we went about doing that. It was really important because in the old world of uh, advertising, they knew they had relationships with directors and photographers and illustrators, but in this new world, we needed to have an understanding of mobile and gaming and social, and, and it wasn't just mobile, it was mobile augmented reality, it was mobile payments, it was, and the list just goes on. So we, you cannot do that, just one person, just one agency. You have got to be able to work and collaborate in small little teams with partners. So an example of that, um, of new partnerships and some disruptive behavior um, is we do these Silicon Roundabout tours. So we have in London a, a place that's been coined Silicon Roundabout in Old Street. And they have loads of startups and, um, or Tech City um, also are in there. And so we, we have a tour. There's about a dozen people from Ogilvy. We get on a bus and we go off and meet all these different companies. And there was one company in particular that I loved called It's Nice That. Um, and with them, we developed. I was conscious that I represented Rory as a, his agent. And um, yet, we hadn't actually done a book for him. And a lot of American um, people that I was speaking to about negotiating his fees kept asking, has he been published? So with It's Nice That, we went about publishing a book with all of the things that Rory had written about on Brand, Republic, and Spectator. 
So um, not that I'd ever published a book before, but I knew that if I published it myself and didn't go through the normal tried and tested routes, one, we'd have a, a, an understanding of what it means to publish a book, and two, it meant that I could offer the book at publisher's cost when I then uh, represented Rory with his agent fees, and then I could make up whatever the publisher's cost I wanted it to be, which is more money than into the lab R&D pot, which then means, obviously, I still don't need to ask permission. Even doing that, book, I think two people knew about it because the minute I told, would tell anyone, then someone would have an opinion and someone else would tell someone else and then it would never happen. So anything I do is all under the radar and kind of comes up at the very last minute um, where there's nothing anyone can do about it. So that kind of goes with having a lot of the people that where you, you just ask for um, forgiveness, not permission. And this is something that we did with, the, with our second Silicon Roundabout tour. per pound spent came when they didn't add any extra trains nor change the frequency of the trains, they put dot matrix display boards on the platforms. Because the nature of a weight is not just dependent on its numerical quality, its duration, but on the level of uncertainty you experience during that wait. Waiting seven minutes for a train with a countdown clock is less frustrating and irritating than waiting four minutes knuckle biting going, when's this train going to damn well arrive? Here's a beautiful example of a psychological solution deployed in Korea. Red traffic lights have a countdown delay. It's proven to reduce the accident rate in experiments. Why? Because road range, impatience, and general irritation are massively reduced when you can actually see the, the time you have to wait. In China, not really understanding the principle behind this, they applied the same principle to green traffic lights. Um, <laughs> which isn't a great idea. You're 200 yards away, you realize you've got five seconds to go, you floor it. <laughs> so with that, what I wanted to show Ogilvy when we first did that was that I wanted to get as many people to Storytelling Lab Day as possible and I wanted to sell as many books as possible. But I didn't want to, um, it to take 18 months to do a 30 second TV commercial with a cast of thousands and a cost of hundreds of thousands or millions. So that took three people um, eight weeks at a, cost, a, a fraction of the cost. I, mean, I, I have to be conscious of obviously the cost of, of what you guys pay here, but it was, it was £10,000 to do two one-minute um, uh, pieces of, of, of content, and it, and it did the trick. So it was just showing management that this is the future, this is what is happening, so that they needed to really kind of wake up, and that's Rory. The other thing was, um, and there's going to be a couple of videos I've been going to just bypass because I haven't got long because I've just talk too much, sorry. Um, the fourth insight is get out of your comfort zone. So um, there's a lot of events that happen that no advertising agencies ever go to. That's where we go. So we don't ever put ourselves in any place where there, there are ad things to do. We, we always need to go to places where we know nothing at all. So Will is our creative lab, lab technologist. Um, this is understanding about inspiring creatives. So he goes to IBC in Amsterdam, which is, is like CES in Vegas, kind of consumer electronics show. And he only ha he has two um, KPIs. He's got to build relationships and find new partners, and he does a trend report. He found a, a partner called Mindplay, small little um, startup company. I think there are only about two or three in the company. Um, where you you're, have this EEG where you measure pleasure. We attached him to a semester of learning for storytelling, brought him in for a lab lunch to, the, um, to inspire creatives, and they said, um, is there any way that you can measure pleasure? And then this next film, and I might stop it towards the end because um, I'm running out of time, but if, you, if we do stop it, it is on the Lund Labs um, uh, website and you'll be able to catch it there. This newcomer brand wanted a bigger bite of the dark chocolate market, so they set out to make their little drops famous for pleasure. The Measure of Pleasure was actually commissioned by a chocolate company called Beyond Dark, who, instead of just claiming to have the most pleasurable chocolate, wanted to prove it. For centuries, philosophers have proposed a unit for measuring pleasure, so Beyond Dark partnered with neuroscientists and technologists in a quest to make it real. To gather enough scientifically credible data, we'd need 100 willing members of the so public. We paid people in chocolate. Participants were fitted up to brainwave reading headsets, which were set up to analyse pleasure for the very first time. And the experiment was done at Ravensbourne, which is a, a college that we have a big relationship with.
The tests also proved Beyond Dark 15 to 25% more pleasurable than rivals. On Blue Monday, officially the year's most depressing and then because day, we, work we across released the group, we pulled in the PR department. The first ever pleasure scale made headlines. You've got chocolate by each of you. Tuck into the chocolate. Oh, she's ecstatic on the end. Oh, look. <laughs> All this chatter pushed Beyond Dark from obscurity to page one on Google UK and persuaded one of the UK's largest supermarkets to double their distribution and take on new flavours. So it starts to be more about business and actually Dark not about technology. Born, with followers suggesting the pleasures we'll be measuring next. The findings from the test became the advertising. last, a brand could make emotional claims that were proven. Beyond Dark enjoyed a very pleasurable sales uplift, prompting speculation about where all this could lead us. So these are the type of things that we do within labs. They're not traditional, as you would expect uh, you, you know, uh, an agency like an Ogilvy would be doing. Um, because they do obviously still have the day job and still have to do the, the, the usual TV and print. So the next insight, if you can see it and touch it, it feels real. This was really important. So um, Ogilvy have a new division called um, Ogilvy Change, and it touches on everything to do with behavior change. And it is a really exciting space for labs to be, and, and labs funded for the website to be done. And then we knew that we wanted to have something tangible as what does it mean, behavior change? So a couple of us were in the bar one night and chatting, and, and one of the uh, senior planners came up with an idea about um, doing this next thing, which would then make it more tangible as to what does behavior change mean. So this came out of that. As the London riots of August 2011 took hold, people in Greenwich burnt down the pub they drank in and looted the shops where they bought their food. But as the disturbances died down, antisocial behaviour in the area continued. Greenwich Council needed to find a way to stop the problem minority from destroying their own community. We believed that the very shutters that were ripped from their runners could be part of the problem. Could we turn the shutters into part of the solution? We wanted to conduct a social experiment. In 2009, a team of scientists in Pennsylvania found proof that the large head, round face and big eyes so beloved of Disney actually motivates caring behaviour in adults. They proved that cute matters to the brain. If I was in local government, I know it would be a lot easier to say I'm getting more police out there than to say I'm painting a few shutters. And I think we need to work to build confidence that these kind of interventions have their role, that they work and they have their role and get them taken as seriously as hard interventions which are expensive and in the past have proven not to work. Could the power of cute minimise antisocial... I'm stopping it there only because of time but if you want to um, see the results, the results were 18% crime rate went down in that street because of those babies faces being painted and not one of them has been touched since. So um, the point is, is that changing people's behavior just from the baby's face is very powerful. So um, next insight, work with the right people. So I'd I've kind of touched on that with semesters of learning, but with Rough Diamond, what that is, is looking for diverse talent. So we start as young as 14 um, to 16 year olds with Ideas Foundation, they're at the bottom of the diamond. And we work with all the schools in the boroughs of Hackney Tower, Hamlets and Greenwich, which are very kind of poor areas within London. We find the kids that are failing have been kicked out of school or who are, um, are not engaging with, with, with school in any way. We bring them into Ogilvy and we mentor them, but we don't just say, hi, you know, how are you? And then, bye, have a nice life. We actually bring them in um, and then we route them through to either go to Ravensbourne or School Communication Arts to do further education um, to the age of um, 18, 19. And then they have the... Uh, um, opportunity at those two colleges because they they do um, they, they converge all of the creative uh, syllabus so fashion and, and 3d graphics and uh, broadcast etc and then we speed date them about 50 or 60 of them every single year across all of those courses and then we hand pick five or six of them and they work with us for the year so they do 12 weeks in the summer um, and everyone knows the kind of Ravensbourne kids are, are coming in. Then they go back to school in the September um, to do their final year. The deal is they teach their teachers 
um, what industry wants, because I was fed up with the teachers saying what industry needs, and they'd never worked in industry a day in their lives. Um, they teach their teachers, they come back to us at Christmas, come back to us at Easter, and then we look to employ. So we make up job t titles and job roles for them because they are, there are so many new roles that now are needed that aren't just a planner, that aren't just a creative, that aren't just a, an account person. And then once they're in at Ogilvy, then they can be with us for four or five years and they have the ability to go on a um, marketing academy program. And with that, then they're mentored by top CEOs and CMOs in the country. So you can take a kid that's failing um, in a very kind of um, not very privileged area, very poor area, and, um, and route them through the rough diamond to be future leaders potentially. So that is a program that's now in its fifth year and our creative uh, technologist uh, Will is one of those guys. So that's a, um, an amazing program. A little success leads to attention. So you just need to kind of, as the, uh, Rob said before, uh, we, we always call it JFDI, which is a kind of you just said, just fucking do it. And then that is literally what we did with this, uh, with pretty much everything. Holition were beta testing in our lab about five and a half years ago. And it was a lovely little augmented reality bracelet thing that, um, like this, you'd put on your hand and you'd put your wrist up to the screen. And then you'd see a catalogue of watches on your wrist or, or jewellery or, or glasses. It got to the point where it was quite robust. We then sold it on to um, Geometry, which is, is Ogilvy's activation arm. And they did some work with Helena Christensen and Selfridges, where they put in a virtual where you could try on underwear without actually getting undressed. So that was what was used with beta testing. The art of giving. So we always give back. So we're always outside of London. Um, Shannon at the moment is in Newcastle. I do some stuff in Bristol with Media Sandbox, where we mentor um, uh, startups. One of the startups was a guy called Adam from New Design who had this idea that he wanted to make a musical instrument. And he literally, when we first saw it, it was a round ball with like paper cups stuck on it. And we got it to the point within three to six months where it was a physical product. And then we attached him to our music lab day and had him come in and, and meet all these different people. And we live streamed. Um, we made that into kind of like a Glastonbury at, at Ogilvy. Um, and now his product is shipping. And I mean, he's just absolutely making a fortune. It's called an Alpha Sphere. So um, you should check that out as well. I and mean, that literally just came from just an idea in his head. And, and, and now the guy is, is hugely successful. Put money behind non-traditional advertising events. So we don't just slap a logo on with the labs and then say, oh, yeah, we want a speaker slot and, as, as you would traditionally. So I'd, we do a lot of mentoring with Idea Shop, um, at, with the community. And I'd met a, a girl there called Kerry who wanted to set up her own show. She set up 3D print shows. So our sponsorship with that was not putting a logo on and, and, and speaking. It was having eight... 3D printers and then having a school day where 3,000 schools came in and we taught them how to 3D print and spoke to them about CAD drawings and then winners of, um, of a, um, a, a big event, then the winners of each school that won that event, there were nine printers to give away and, um, and they're doing brilliantly with those printers. We also got three printers over, over, over at Ogilvy to kind of engage with and practice on, which then led to our... Um, IBM 3D printing. I'm not going to play the film, though. Thoughts to leave you with? Educate, educate, educate. I mean, I, but we don't do it in, in a room full of people that we tell them what to do. We do it via the semesters where they don't even know they're being educated. Um, and, and the semesters are, are really great because it's, it's inclusive learning and um, it's not kind of sitting down talking at someone. R&D needs to be autonomy and budget. Um, Define your measures of success, achieving an 80-20 split. So just saying to a client that, that is open to these kind of things, just give us 20% to experiment and, and, and just see where it goes. Um, prove by doing and hire hunters. So they're the ones that are like yourself. You can spot them quite easily. They're the ones that just get it when you're having a conversation. The ones that don't get it are the ones that are very linear in their, in their thinking. I suppose it's the same as that. Um, the thumb thing that Simon did earlier with the right brain, left brain. It's, it's the hunters that I'm looking for within that lab environment who have the stomach to do something that's never been done before. And thank you and good luck. <laughs>